Thank you for watching, and let's get right to it. We have more updates on Washington State Governor Inslee and AG Bob Ferguson's Violent Sex Predator Quiet Release Program. Now, if you remember from our last couple of videos on this subject, and this is the fourth one in the series, Governor Inslee, AG Ferguson, they're quietly releasing some of the worst violent sex predators in the history of the state of Washington from the currently quite secure facility located on the isolated McNeil Island in Puget Sound. And they're paying twice as much to dump them into homes and neighborhoods near you. So we have more information now because we have some internal emails from the Washington State Department of Corrections and the Department of Social and Health Services who are the agencies tasked with this release project. And I'm pretty sure that these are emails that both Inslee and Ferguson wish you didn't know about. So let's discuss what we have learned. Now, before I go further, however, I want to remind everyone watching this video to hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. It costs you nothing, but it helps improve the visibility of videos like this with your friends. Also, you can text a link of this video actually from your phone to your friends and neighbors who probably should know this stuff just as well. Now, finally, if you think I'm missing something or if you have additional information that everyone else should know, don't forget to leave your comments below. I typically read all of them and I'm often able to respond to most of them. Okay, so let's talk about what we have learned from these internal government emails that I'm sure Governor Inslee and Ferguson absolutely don't want you to know. Now, I want to point out that we have a large number of whistleblowers of both agencies who are genuinely disgusted with the incompetence, the failures, and the disaster of these policies. Good people do work in these places, but they usually, unfortunately, are just not in positions of authority. Uh, the good ones seem to get weeded out when it comes to promotions in the Inslee administration, and public records are being found by many people throughout our state as the ugliness of this project and others like it is revealed. So remember, uh, this popped up on our radar amidst a sea of just terrible ideas and fiascos because of an unsecured, inadequately staffed house that was uh, actually located between Tenino and Tumwater, run by a for-profit organization named Supreme Living. And they lied about how they planned to use this house uh, that they bought. And they were trying to sneak in about a half dozen violent sex predators while getting paid as much as $35,000 per month per predator that they dumped there. Now, this shady organization was, and it is, operated and fronted by a former D DSHS employee named Angela Ronaldo here, who has been frequently caught lying to the public and apparently everyone else. Now, we've discussed some of these details in the previous videos. At this point, the Tonino House is temporarily delayed in accepting any violent predators, actually, due to excellent work by local activists and the cooperation by the Thurston County Commissioners Gary Edwards and Carolina Mejia, particularly, as well as very good work done by newly elected Sheriff Derek Sanders, who helped convince the Thurston County Health Department to essentially red tag this home until the uh, Supreme Living folk got the septic water in the kitchen facilities up to the commercial standard that was required for this type of operation. However, despite this temporary victory, uh, which was all due to the excellent work by these local citizens and some local elected officials, this terrible policy idea really continues and it's far more than just Thurston County. So according to some internal DOC and DSHS emails that I've acquired, there are many other locations in the state who have contracted to take these McNeil Island predators and other sites that they're scouting right now to release them, and some are probably gonna be near you. Now, let's just keep in mind, we're not just talking about regular convicted sex offenders here. Washington State already has 22,000 or so of people who basically fit that category, and they have already live in our community. They've been released, and they're being released all the time. They're registered with the state, and you can actually see how many live near you, uh, and if you live in a different state, you might or might not have a similar program for registering convicted sex offenders. Washington State's actually pretty good on this policy, and has been since it was first implemented in 1990. However, we are not talking about those guys. We're only talking about those who have form, basically the states formally classified them as violent sex predators. And they're deemed so dangerous and so likely to reoffend that McNeil Island here was considered the only safe place to house them, either after serving their sentences or because they were so mentally insane that they were unfit for trial in the first place. Now, approximately 60% or so of these violent sex predators are pedophiles who primarily target uh, young children and murder, assault, rape, kidnapping, etc. They're not uncommon crimes that these guys have committed. So first, let's talk about these homes that they want to dump these guys in right now. And according to a February 2nd, 
2022 email from Jonathan Sherry, who appears to be the director of discharge planning uh, to a variety of other Department of Corrections and DSHS employees. A year ago, they had a handful of locations that they already identified for dumping these violent sex predators off of McNeil Island. And these included, as I mentioned earlier, the Supreme Living House here in Tonino. It also includes three different houses in Kent uh, that are operated by a company called uh, Wellbeing Residential. So one house is on Summit Avenue just off James Street in downtown Kent, if you know where that is. It's conveniently within walking distance of the Kent Station. Um, another house is just a few blocks away on Hilltap Ave uh, Avenue. And then there's another house on 94th Avenue, and they're, they're kind of all clustered in downtown Kent there. And they're planning to drop about 17 violent sex predators in downtown Kent. That's what it looks like anyway. Now, they also had a Seattle house for five predators on Pilgrim Street in South Seattle. And then they also had a location called Joe's Place out in Walla Walla. I didn't see an address there, but presumably it's close to Whitman uh, campus. I mean, it's nice if you locate violent sex predators next to college campuses. Uh, but I don't have the address for that one yet in this email. It's just worth pointing out. Now, I've linked to the original email records down below, and I, I want to point this out because it's about 692 pages, and not all of it's super exciting reading, and some of it looks repetitious if you look through it, but I just want to point out that what stood out to me in this video, but you can find more information that I certainly have missed, and I'm, I'm happy to crowdsource the effort. So you go below to the link. I've hosted this, um, this series of emails on my website, and you can surf it there. Download it for yourself, share the link with others, or print it out if you want. It's your choice, but please feel free to help in the research efforts because we're likely to keep uncovering a lot more that we didn't know about just a few weeks ago. So please note that this email I've referenced here is a year old, and that's just a few months ago, but they've been new locations that we've discovered since then in Enumclaw, both in uh, South Pierce County and other places around the state likely that we know are being used in the same way. But I can only report what I'm learning from these emails that I currently have. Uh, I also want to point out that this email reference to the Tonino House was over a year before they were getting ready to bring a violent sex predator into the neighborhood. And at that time, the very time this email was being written, Supreme Living was lying to the neighbors and telling them that they were planning to use that place to house foster children. So as you read these emails, you can see uh, periodically the concern by both DSHS and DOC frontline staff in regards to the nature of how they're being asked to implement HB 5163, which we talked about earlier. That was the enabling legislation sponsored by Democrats in the state Senate in 2021, right in the middle of the COVID lockdown era. And we've discussed this in previous videos. It is clear to me that many of these frontline staff, based on these emails, are very concerned about this program. They're concerned about the vendors who are trying to hop on the cash gravy train. And they're very concerned about the apparent pressure from above to dump these violent sex predators into the community. And I'm gonna repeat the fact that I believe a lot of good people, again, work in these agencies, but the good ones apparently are never in charge, particularly in this Inslee Ferguson era of state government. So like many people in government, they're being told to do things that they know is wrong, or it's a bad idea, and you can see them trying to moderate the insanity, restrain the stupidity, slow things down, or at least make a horrible idea just a little bit less bad when it gets implemented. Now I'm gonna quote from an email dated June 9th, 2022, where correction specialist Jessica Bullock states, and I quote, I would like to pass along some concerns regarding what has been going on with this. Throughout this investigation, I have received various things implying that this placement was fully determined and agreed upon prior to DOC receiving the investigation. There have been emails, as the one below, detailing everyone being on board with releasing Mr. Marshall without the investigation being completed, and that's an end quote. So she's referring there to a convicted violent sex predator, Mr. Marshall, who the state pl was planning to place in a Supreme Living facility in Tonino. Now, later in that same email, she also includes, quote, where this is coming from, I'm not sure. There seems to be an attempt at trying to prove SCC can take on the discharge planning, but what is showing problematic to include the confrontational interaction with the housing provider had with me when she first met is that it provides a false sense of everyone is on in agreement and on board with the housing plan. Now, when she says, and that's an unquote there, SCC is actually DSHS's special commitment center, mostly located at McNeil Island. And the housing provider that she quoted there, referenced in that email is actually Angela Ronaldo, who we've discussed quite a bit before. Angela Ronaldo runs Supreme Living. 
Now, I'll note that the only thing which delayed the release of this Mr. Marshall, the first violent sex predator they planned to dump in Tonino, was some neighbors who engaged the county to delay the opening of the facility when they first discovered Supreme Living had lied about the foster kids story and instead were bringing in a half dozen violent sex predators to this house. That initial exposure is what delayed the home from the planned opening uh, earlier uh, this month, which has since been delayed again. So I'll remind you that this is, was delayed again only because people got involved. Now, one of the documents included in these 692 pages uh, includes a review that was made by a DOC employee last summer of the Tonino facility and included this quote, which I'm going to quote here exactly. It's a long quote, but you should definitely be aware of it. The court, this is a quote, the court should be aware that while communicating with Angelo Ronaldo, I explained the purpose of my questions. During the initial conversation, there appeared to be a level of aggressive engagement from Angela Ronaldo based upon the questions. DOC needed to clarify her level of understanding about RCW 71.09 due to some of the answers she provided, which highlighted a potential lack of understanding. We were specifically discussing her understanding of security and chaperoning residents in the community. She stated that in the future, the staff would potentially take residents to outings as a group where the ratio would not be one to one. During this discussion, when trying to gain clarity of whether she was under the impression that she could use the same models from the Western State Hospital side, she made statements such as, we create a lot of programs and I appreciate the lecture, but I have a master's degree and I know what I'm talking about. Now, since then, these issues appear to have changed, but were somewhat concerning as it brings into question her future cooperation with DOC. Now, as you can see from the interaction that government staff had with Angela Ronaldo, her arrogance and condescension, which we've witnessed when she, uh, she spoke to the public, was on full display for them as well. And the concerns raised by the Department of Corrections for the Supreme Living Facility in Tonino clearly included a lack of security, proximity to places like the water pool park for kids next door, the problems with monitoring, the lack of any house rules at all, and a variety of other issues not dissimilar, in fact, almost identical to the concerns raised by the community long before these email records were ever uncovered. So everyone involved knows that this is a bad program and a bad idea, and yet Inslee and Ferguson and the unqualified and apparently uncontrollable for-profit groups and the Democrats in the state legislature, unfortunately, who seem enthusiastic about doing it anyway. And there are no concerns expressed by leadership anywhere, just cheerleading for the future fiascos to unfold. Now, I'll also point out that the more I look into this Angela Ronaldo here, her business partners and her Supreme Living organization, and all the things that she has done since graduating from the Evergreen State College, I have some real concerns about her ability to honestly run any type of facility like this anywhere. In addition to this proposed Tonino house, she already operates a similar, less restrictive alternative house for released mental patients in Olympia. And some of these are people who were able to avoid criminal trials for violent acts that they committed by claiming that they were temporarily insane. And now, well, it's actually come recently to my attention that at least one of these violent people absconded or eloped, as they like to call it now. The rest of us would call it escaped. And their whereabouts are not known. Now, is this really good public policy? Is there anyone in this scheme at all who cares a bit about the future victims that they're absolutely creating with these feel-good virtue signaling programs? How many future victims could we save by not running such a poorly conceived and incompetently executed fiasco? Now, speaking of fiascos, I, I promise that I'll get to a more in-depth review of the McNeil Island story. However, this does appear to be an evolving discussion on this topic right now as well. And here we have an island that's been used first as a federal penitentiary since, well, decades before Washington State actually became a state in 1889. And the last homesteader on the islands, they were removed uh, in the, from that island uh, in the 1930s via eminent domain. The feds decided to stop using it as a prison in the late 1970s, but Washington State intervened in the early 1980s. And essentially, they got permission to convert into a state prison, which the state used until it was mothballed in 2011. The Violent Sex Predator Special Commitment Center was moved to McNeil Island decades ago, and it has been a perfect location, even after the prison was closed, for safely housing the most violent sex predators Washington State has ever caught. So the state was angry that we pointed out the obvious trend here to shut down McNeil Island and dump these guys in our neighborhoods. 
uh, all throughout the state. And now Inslee's backpedaling, and he's denying that this is his plan, and yet you will see, which I've kind of shown here, but I've also linked it below, a whole report that was produced by the state back in 2012. It was enabled by legislation that was proposed by former Olympia State Senator Karen Frazier, who currently serves on the board of Evergreen State College. And you can see in this report down there uh, where the state clearly is trying to do something different with the island. And nobody really believes that any senior person in this administration is uh, saying anything truthful right now because all the evidence that they're giving us seems to indicate other plans. And it seems that they're not being honest. And I know, I know, it's not the first time that it's happened, but it's kind of disturbing. Now, a few days ago, the entire senior administration of McNeil Island bailed off the island for an emergency meeting, presumably in Olympia. I don't have the details yet on that meeting, but this is only happening right now because we are putting public scrutiny, a lot of it, on this whole operation. And I'll point out, staff has reported that the local fire department on the island has been doing controlled burns of older homes and other actions have been taken that seem to be degrading those facilities out there. So these are not the things you do if you have planned to maintain this commitment center. Now I'm filming this video just a few hours before a community organized meeting is happening in Enumclaw in Eastern King County. And it's the citizens who live there, they've discovered one of these homes secretly launched right next door to families and then children. Now, I know that this might come as a surprise to our leaders in government, but people really don't get happier with you when they find out that you've been concealing ugly schemes like this, which can clearly put their children and their families at risk. I know that's perplexing to senior government officials for, for some reason. However, the deeper we dig, the more we uncover, the more we will expose about it and about this program. And it just seems like we're only beginning to unravel the thread of this unraveling scheme. We can't ignore this or just pretend that it isn't happening. And we don't believe the misdirection or the silly stories coming out of Inslee or Ferguson's offices. They're certainly, they don't have our best interests as part of their plan. I'm not exactly sure which special interests and deep pocket donors that they're rewarding here, but they're not concerned about the damage they do to the rest of us. So I encourage you uh, to feel free to educate yourself. You will learn a lot if you want to do so. And the links I have down below, those should be very helpful. And I hope that they provide some good background on the story. I mean, don't believe me, go look for yourself. Now, in closing, I just have three takeaways for everyone watching this video. The first is to seek the truth. It might be ugly. It might not be what you wanna know, but at least you can face it head on once you know it. Number two, you can't run away. There, there's just no escaping this stuff. The crazy, the insane, and the corruption, that's gonna follow you no matter where you go. The key is to expose it here, stop it now, and then it doesn't have to spread anywhere else. Now finally, you can make a difference. I'm just one guy reporting what I find. The real heroes and the people who really make the difference are the activists and the neighbors who banded together near me in Tonino, for example, to expose the truth and to stop this crazed, dangerous scheme from happening in their neighborhood. And I encourage you to be like them, because as I always say, the future belongs to those who show up.